Well, good afternoon, everybody, and thank you for tuning into this webinar, Delving into the Dark Side of Personality Beyond the Fundamentals. Um, mainly, this is designed for people who have already been trained in the Hogan Development Survey, as we'll be introducing the subscales and also illustrating how to devise coaching strategies that would be appropriate for individual HDS profiles. But just in case there are any of you out there, any attendees who aren't particularly familiar with the HDS and the aspects of dark side personality that it assesses, I just want to mention its rationale and measurement goals. So the HDS measures extremes of personality. It looks at those aspects of our temperament that surface only at particular times, maybe when we're under pressure or feeling very stressed, or it could actually be when we're feeling invulnerable or even too relaxed and we're not taking the usual care over how we come across to other people. We're not managing our social impression as well as usual. The thing about these extremes of personality though is that they can often have been strengths for us up to a certain point. They might be very much a defining feature of our personality, of our temperament. The problem comes that when we start to overplay them, when we take our eye off the ball and we do too much of them, or we do them in a way that can become irritating to others, and they start to have a negative in impact on others. And they're counterproductive for us because they interfere with our ability to relate to our colleagues, they, they interfere with our ability to build a team, and to try to engage the trust and commitment from people who work with us and around us. Um, so there are particular use in coaching situations and in leadership situations where we're looking at trying to show people how they can be more effective if they rein in some of these behaviours and be more successful at work. But the specific focus today then is um, this webinar is going to look at how the value of this assessment, the value of the Hope and Development Survey can be maximised for coaching and development purposes. So just a quick through run through the agenda for today. I'll do um, a reminder of the derailed taxonomy that's measured by the Hogan Development Survey. Then I'll introduce the subscales, the, this, the notion of the subscales and also some examples of subscales. I'll also outline a suggested framework for coaching strategies and I'll give a couple of case studies to demonstrate both the utility of um, refining interpretations using the subscales and in deploying some of the coaching strategies. Okay, so a quick whiz through the derailer taxonomy. As a reminder for people, if either if you're new to this or if you haven't used the HDS for a while, there are 11 scales in total on the HDS, and these 11 scales factor analyze into three main clusters. The first cluster then is what's up here on your screen, moving away from people. And this cluster is characterized by managing your feelings of inadequacy or insecurity, by avoiding contact with others, by withdrawing from others. And that withdrawal could be both a physical withdrawal or it could be a mental or emotional withdrawal. And there are five scales that fall into this category. And I'm just gonna mention very briefly what are the upsides and downsides of each of these scales. So firstly, the excitable, these people are, can be passionate and intense, but conversely can be moody and self-critical and unpredictable, hard to, to know where you stand with these people. Um, the second scale is the sceptical one, these people can seem very astute, astute and shrewd, um, uh, but at the same time, when they overplay it, they become overly suspicious, mistrusting, almost tending towards paranoia at times. Uh, the third scale, the cautious one, these people can seem very prepared, they like to know what they're talking about, but um, they can also, though, seem too fearful to speak up for fear of embarrassment, or for fear of being criticised. They can be very socially anxious people. Um, the fourth scale in this cluster, reserved, these people can seem very self-sufficient, they're happy to get on with stuff on their own, they actually enjoy being on their own. But the downside to you overplaying this is that they can seem very remote, distant, perhaps rather cold and unfriendly and hard to reach. And the final scale here is the leisurely scale. So these people can seem very focused and they'll get on with their own agenda. But uh, when they overplay it, they can be very resistant to advice. They like to do what they want to do and what they decided to do. And they don't like to be interrupted very much. 
So that's uh, a quick introduction to the moving away cluster. The second cluster then is the moving against people cluster. And this is characterized by uh, people who manage their self doubts by persuading and influencing and um, almost seducing people, but it can come over as being rather dominating and intimidating, trying to co opt people around to your point of view or your way of thinking. There are four scales here. The first one, bold, these people can be seem very confident, optimistic, dynamic, energetic, but they can also um, overplay it and become very arrogant and opinionated. Secondly, the mischievous scale, there's lots of upsides. These people can seem very charming and persuasive, quite interesting people, but on the downside, rather manipulative and taking risks that other people get very uncomfortable with. Thirdly, the colourful scale, these people have lots to say, they can seem very vivacious, the life and soul of the party, but um, perhaps rather overly dramatic and needy and attention seeking when overplaying it. Final scale here, imaginative. These people can be a wonderful resource of creative ideas, but sometimes those ideas can become rather eccentric, um, rather bizarre, and they can become rather self-absorbed in these ideas that they think are great, but other people think are um, rather uh, difficult to understand. The final cluster then, the moving towards people, cluster is characterized by managing your insecurities by conforming, complying, building alliances, almost controlling your environment. And the first scale here is the diligent scale. These people like to be organized and attentive to detail, but they can also be overly fussy and critical of others who don't match their high standards and are perhaps reluctant to delegate. And the final scale, then the dutiful one, people who score high on this can seem like a really you know, good team player, very agreeable, but um, their sort of fear of disagreeing with people can lead to them seeming rather indecisive and dependent. Um, so that's a really quick whiz through the uh, 11 scales of the HDS, just in case anybody needed a reminder or a refresh. Moving on now to the heart of the webinar, and I'd like to introduce the notion of the subscales. Now, these subscales actually were launched a couple of years ago. They were launched in February 2015, and some of you will be familiar with them already. There were a number of reasons why Hogan Assessment Systems decided to launch the subscales. One was just a general recognition that there were distinct themes. There were a number of behavioral themes clearly associated with each HDS scale, it wasn't just one overarching theme. Secondly, uh, clients were actually beginning to ask for more detailed information for the HDS scale. They wanted more than just a single score. And finally, um, there was growing uh, evidence, research evidence, of a reliability and validity um, uh, basis for the subscale structure. So why would subscales be useful? One way of looking at this would be to say, okay, well, let's have a look at a primary scale and its descriptors and the performance implications that we normally think about in relation to that scale. If we just took one uh, overall, like if we just had the high score on the scale on its own. So here we've got the example of somebody who scores high and colorful. And in the bottom right, you can see that there are a number of performance implications for people who score high on this scale. So they range from being colourful and socially skilled, um, but also sometimes over committing, flitting from thing to thing because they, they, they do anything to draw attention to themselves. Probably not listening well because once they get into performance mode, they're enjoying the sound of their own voice rather too much. Maybe uh, jostling for leadership positions only in the sense that because it, it keeps the spotlight on them and satisfies their need for attention and also possibly dominating social situations, because these people like to talk a lot and they think you're going to be interested in what they have to say. But if we take that same scale, then colourful, and we take a look at the subscales that are on it and we take the example that we've got here and, and look at their actual scores on the subscales, you can see we've got the colourful scale that's highlighted um, amongst the, the HDS scale profiles and this person's got a score at the 93rd percentile on colourful, so no doubt about it, a high score. Normally you might just you know, go through all of the performance implications for this person. But if we look underneath and we look at their subscale scores, you can see there are three subscales here, public confidence, distractible, and self-display. The scoring system here for each of these is based on quartile scores. 
So if they've got uh, three or four of those bricks coloured in there at the third or the fourth quartile, so they're in the high range there. What you can see here is that the distractible subscale is the one where they've actually received a low score. And this is generally how you would use the subscale scores, because you're looking at people who have a high score on an HDS scale anyway, because you're looking for potential problem areas. Where these subscales become most useful is where there's a low score on one, and then you know that's an area not to have to focus on for that particular individual. So this individual may well behave in a, in a rather dramatic and attention-seeking manner, but they're not going to be, have some of those more superficial, distractible qualities that can be associated with an, that an individual who got a high score on the distractible subscale as well would display. So this gives you uh, an inkling, an idea into how you can use that subscale information to refine your interpretation of an HDS profile. This next table, which is full of information, is just there to show you that you've got all of the 11 HDS scales on the left-hand side, and then for each of those scales, you've got their three subscales um, delineated there. Um, obviously, that's a lot of subscales to go through, so there isn't time here to go through all of these. So what I'm going to do is to take one example from each of the three main clusters. So starting with one from the moving away cluster, I'm going to start with the leisurely scale and look at the, its three associated subscales. So here we've got passive aggressive, unappreciated and irritated. And describing each of these in turn, then, the, the passive aggressive subscale is all about smiling but not doing. These are the people who will come across as quite pleasant and you might think that they're actually going to do what you've asked them to do. But actually, because of this private resentment, um, they may well put your request to the bottom of the pile or just find ways to delay doing stuff for you. So the sample item here is I sometimes put off doing things for people I don't like. The second subscale is unappreciated. And these people just generally feel unappreciated. They always think that they work harder than everybody else. They think that what they're doing is more important than what anybody else is doing. So a sample item here is people at work expect me to do everything. So they feel very burdened and unappreciated. And the last subscale is irritated. So these are the people who are just generally irritated by being interrupted or having other demands placed on them. If anything, you know, interrupts them and takes them off to a different timetable or if they're asked to reprioritize work, then they will feel irritated. But they may, they may be able to mask that irritation. So those, that's an example from the moving away cluster. Moving on to the moving against cluster, I've chosen the mischievous scale here to illustrate the subscales and the uh, extra information that you get from them. Here we've got risky, impulsive and manipulative. So the, uh, the risky subscale is all about clearly uh, taking risks, particularly taking risks that other people feel uncomfortable with, but there's also an element of feeling that normal rules don't apply to these people. And sample item here is I try things that other people think are too risky. The second one is impulsive, so this is just acting on the spur of the moment, as the sample item says, just doing stuff because you want to without thinking it through or considering any of the long-term consequences. And the final one is the manipulative part. I mean, there is always, um, or can be, if they score high on this subscale, an element of deceit associated with the mischievous scale on the HDS. So these people, if they score high here, um, will be prepared to be manipulative, possibly even exploitative. Um, and they don't worry about it though either, they don't feel any remorse about doing this. So a sample item here is when I want to get my way, I know how to turn on the char. And uh, finally, to illustrate the subscales, I've chosen the dutiful scale from the moving towards cluster. And here we've got the three subscales of indecisive, ingratiating and conforming. So indecisive is fairly self-explanatory, but I mean, these people are indecisive because they're very dependent on, on others. Um, they want to know what other people think before they'll commit to a decision. Um, a sample item on important issues, I dislike making decisions on my own. 
Ingratiating, this is about being very eager to please, particularly upwards, making sure that um, your superiors are hearing what you think you want them to hear. So there's an element of flattery and not contradicting people. Um, it's not light and there's nothing wrong with flattering your boss. And then the final subscale here is conforming. So these people actually enjoy conforming. They almost enjoy subsuming what they might think to other people's wishes. But I think this is partly born of a fear. I mean, these people are quite fearful. They're very anxious not to disagree or to be in conflict with others. And the sample item here is I take pride in being a good follower. So hopefully that's given you a flavour of the subscales for the HDS and some insight into the benefits of not only looking at the overall high score on a particular HDS scale, but checking to see if there are any low scoring subscales amongst those. So to see if there are any aspects of a particular HDS characteristic that don't apply to the individual that you're coaching or discussing the profile with, so that you can tailor and refine your interpretation appropriately. Okay, uh, moving on to some coaching strategies, and here we have a suggested potential structure for a coaching feedback session. There's just a, a number of steps. The first step uh, in the process is all about raising awareness. It's about the challenge here is for the coach to try to raise levels of self awareness in the individual coaching. Um, some people are more, much more self-aware than others about their HDS profile and about the negative impact they might be having on other people, but others are simply not aware. And uh, when we go through some case studies, I'll give you some examples of questions that you could raise with individuals to check their level of self-awareness and see if they, need to, um, if, if, if they need to act on that. The second step then would be about challenging individuals' assumptions around their HDS profile, even if they are self-aware, even if they do know that, say for instance, if they're high on the bold scale and they maybe come across as overconfident at times, they may yet have no inkling of how negatively that can come across, what is the negative impact that they're having on their colleagues, on their peers, on their direct reports. So the challenge here is to look at those assumptions and to make sure that they start to tune into that more, that they start to listen to feedback more and hopefully start to act on that feedback rather more. And then the final step three is to try to encourage and to foster change in behaviour in these individuals and to give them strategies for doing this. Um, you can't change personality, particularly with the HDS, these are extreme characteristics that we're looking at. These have been um, sort of embedded styles of behaviour for an individual over a long period of time and they're born out of insecurities and anxieties that that individual has. So you're not going to eradicate those fears or anxieties in a coaching process. But what you can try to do is uh, to, through increasing the individual's self-awareness, increasing their awareness of how they're coming across to other people, and increasing their awareness of what are the benefits in changing that behaviour, you can unlock, hopefully, some motivators to rein in some of those behaviours, to do less of them, and hopefully to begin to have a positive impact on their colleagues and ultimately on their careers. So taking this framework and applying it to a couple of uh, case studies is what I'm going to do next. Um, and both of these case studies, the actual individuals, come from a book that many of you will be familiar with. It's the Cairo and Dotlich book, Why CEOs Fail. And it's a really useful book in bringing HTS profiles to life. And this particular individual, Josh, is their example of somebody who's high on the reserve scale. So um, Josh was a CEO of a very successful software company. Um, he was particularly a whiz at all of the techie stuff. He had a brilliant grasp of the software market. And he was absolutely instrumental in growing the company through developing new products. The problem was that the bottom uh, suddenly fell out of the market. Other organizations and individuals copied his ideas. And there was a massive downturn in the company's fortunes. At this point, his colleagues, the people that he worked with, were all looking to him for support and reassurance. 
Interestingly, in good times, when things were going well, whilst he wasn't really one for doing lots of socialising, he was able to engage with others and to listen to their ideas. The problem was that when it, he was in crisis mode, he cut himself off from other people. He retreated into his office, started just to become completely immersed in his own work. He was totally focused on trying to save the company. Um, and he didn't communicate with his employees, so they ultimately felt rather alienated and abandoned. But this was his kind of his crisis mode. This was how he, the only way that he knew how to deal with trying to save the company. So if we think about our coaching strategies and we think about Josh, um, we can start to think. So what kinds of questions might we ask him to see uh, to what level his he's actually aware of some of these behaviours, how much does he need to change? So some example questions that you could use would be to ask him, is he aware that he tends to hide his weaknesses rather than communicating with people if things are going wrong? Does he think that he's hard to read? Does he realise that other people you know, don't really understand where he's coming from or he's not communicating enough with them? Does he realise that, that he disappears in a crisis? Is he aware that this is something that he does? Does he realise that it's become something that is now routine? It's a sort of entrenched style of behaviour for him. And finally, you could ask him if he feels that he has a hard time dealing with conflict. Um, the person who's high on reserved um, in this sort of crisis mode will realise there'll be times for the scenarios that they might come up with that other people might not like or other people will have different ideas and actually he won't want to deal with other people's ideas just because he doesn't like dealing with other people not because he's worried about being indecisive or wanting, wanting to please people he just prefers to be on his own so those are some sample questions you could ask him to start the self-awareness process now let's have a look at some coaching strategies you might use with Josh or anybody who's high on the reserve scale. The thing about people who are high on the scale is that you can't ask them simply just to go out there and interact with other people all the time. This would be totally against their nature, it would seem very artificial, and for the individual it would be a very difficult thing for them to do. And it would probably make him and other people feel rather uncomfortable. So instead, what the focus needs to be on is about effective communication at times when it's actually needed and also to give Josh some um, strategies around being able to withdraw from people um, ways in which he can disengage from these interactions without having a negative impact on the relationship. So breaking this down into three steps, what Josh needs to do first is to become very proficient at identifying that need, that feeling that he has to withdraw from others and to think about what are the triggers that elicit this need so that he can start to manage that a bit better. Secondly, he needs to become good at asking other people almost for permission for a time out when he realises he really needs to withdraw. He needs that time alone to think through an issue. But he needs a way of being able to ask for that time out, but also to say to people, but I'm going to follow up with this. You know, we will meet again at such and such a time, or you know, I'll catch up with you in an hour's time. It might be as simple as that. But people like Josh need their headspace, they need to get away, and he needs strategies for being able to do that. And finally, though, he needs to learn how to re-engage, he needs to find a way to go back to those people and restart those conversations and carry on with the communication after he's had his time out. And as it says here, I mean, this bridge could be as simple as actually giving him a form of words, giving him a set of scripts for various scenarios, various ways in which he can start to communicate with people again, or arrange meetings or set times or ways in which um, they can communicate. Okay, so those are some coaching strategies. What I want to have a look at now is to look at subscales of the reserved scale and to see um, what light that sheds upon somebody like Josh and how you might tailor your approach depending which subscales the individual scores high on. So the first subscale of all reserved is introverted. So high scorers on this scale really like to be alone. They really prefer to work alone. They almost feel drained and exhausted by having to maintain social contact with others. Um, so uh, 
specific situations they're going to feel very uncomfortable in is when they're working in a team over a long period of time. So strategy refinements that the coach could suggest um, would be to help this individual know um, how to excuse themselves from a situation, to know when they need to get away and give them a way of communicating that need, but in a positive way. And for the individual who's high on this scale, they're going to feel much more comfortable in this social situation if they have clear time limits, if they know when the, this particular session is going to end and when they can get out of it and excuse themselves and get away. The second subscale on reserved is unsocial. So these people tend to keep others at a distance. Um, they don't really have many close relationships, particularly not at work. They, I mean, they just don't need it. They don't crave that social interaction as others might do. So they might be perceived as being rather cold and unfriendly. Um, what the coach can do here is to try to help a, a leader with a high score, help them to understand that there's a cost to this unsocial behaviour, that um, other people are going to feel distanced by this and perhaps rather alienated. And to help this individual explore ways of trying to be a bit more sociable um, and enlighten them that actually this could have a positive impact on the people that they work with, it's going to be good for team morale, and so ultimately it's going to be good for the organisation. So again, it's not about, you know, these people are not naturally social animals, you can't change that nature, but you can give them strategies and motivations for finding specific ways of interacting with their colleagues a little bit more. And the third subscale here is tough. So if Josh scored high on the tough subscale, then this would suggest that he's very task focused rather than people focused. People who score high on this can seem rather intolerant, particularly if other people are complaining, perhaps rather impatient and unconcerned. Um, they, start, they probably tend to think that other people should just you know, get on with stuff themselves and stop complaining. So there are two key goals here for people who score high on this subscale. Firstly, to try to develop um, greater tolerance and compassion for others, and also to try to achieve a better balance between people issues and actually getting the job done. And um, here, you know, again, you have to try to alert the individual to what are the downsides of behaving in this tough manner. Um, if they're too tough, then people won't want to put in the effort. They won't want to be part of the team. They won't feel motivated by Josh. Um, and uh, so if he can be motivated to change and realise that he'll actually get more out of his people if he does. So summary, some of the things that um, Josh could focus on then, he could keep being the kind of person who is very steady, even when others are becoming a bit panicked or emotional or overwrought because he has that sort of focus and self-sufficiency. Something that he should stop doing is tuning other people out and ignoring their concerns, all of that intolerance and lack of compassion and task focus. He needs to try little by little to bring people, other people into his world a little bit more. And he can start asking other people a bit more for feedback or just checking their understanding after there's been an important interaction or a particular meeting or a particular discussion. That's something that can be used simply as a strategy for making sure that he regularly communicates with people and with colleagues, always after there has been some kind of interaction to say, okay, can I just check your understanding? So that he doesn't just walk away and go and often be, be distant and reserved and aloof yet again. Okay, so that's Josh, that's our example of a reserved person. Our second case study then is Linda, and she scores high on the bold scale. Um, and Linda is somebody who's been very successful by the age of 40. She was a top executive in one of the world's largest global companies. She had studied at Harvard, she'd had a few great years at McKinsey, and then she quickly climbed up the career ladder of her current organization. She has been described by colleagues as brilliant and strategic. Um, she's great at problem solving, she's assertive. And at one point in her career, she was expected by many, probably herself included, to become the next CEO. The problem was that her bold behavior started to take over. And in a way, she became almost too 
intensely like herself, almost like a caricature, as she advanced up the career ladder and she stopped reading social cues, she stopped listening to feedback and she became more and more assertive. She would belittle other people, her conversations would turn to lectures um, and this meant that she began to lose the trust and respect of her colleagues. So, first step is to check her level of self-awareness um, and um, this is always difficult in somebody who's high on this kind of scale. Um, but some questions that you could ask would be to ask her to, cons to consider, does she think that her ego, her sort of self-belief, does she recognise that she has a degree of self-belief that's greater than other people and does that ever cause her to dominate situations? Does she recognise that she can tend to be unwilling to back down in an argument? Does she tend to dig her heels in? Is she aware that she goes into situations with a total self-belief in her rightness and uh, before even bothering to check with other people's views? And is she pretty tenacious in, uh, in expressing those views and not changing them? Is she unwilling to change her position in a fight? So those are some example questions you could use to check her level of self-awareness. And next up we have some coaching strategies. And the thing to say here is, in fact, anybody who scores high in the moving against clusters, so that would be bold or colourful or mischievous or imaginative, in a way these people are automatically less self-aware um, than others, or they're certainly less aware of the negative impact their behaviours might have on others, because they've, been, they've probably had a lot of positive feedback for the strength side of these characteristics. Um, you know, all of that being optimistic and dynamic and energetic and all of that, all of those things are good qualities that organisations like and encourage. Um, but so as a coach, it's very difficult to challenge their vulnerability here too, too directly. Instead, you really need to focus on alerting the individual to how their, these extremes of behaviour start, are starting to impact on others how they're being perceived by other people and how actually that is detracting from other people's opinions of her as being great. So it's not about going in and challenging the notion of her being great, it's about challenging her style of behaviour and how that's interfering with other people's perceptions of how great she is. So specifically, you know, Linda's probably going to see herself as very special and, and entitled to all kinds of things because she thinks she is so good at stuff. Um, and while she probably gives a lot of lip service to being interested in how she comes across to others, she is probably rather oblivious to the rather negative impact the extremes of her behaviour are having on others. Um, the coach then needs to realise that challenging her assumption that she's special is unlikely to be successful um, and so needs to find a way to work around this. So as I said uh, just earlier, the general strategy is going to be around guiding Linda to be more self-aware of the negative impact she's having on others, how people are perceiving her actions, trying to persuade her to change her behaviour so that others will view her more, more positively. And coaching can focus on specific aspects of behaviour that might be blocking that special status that she feels that she deserves and can focus on unlocking uh, the key to reining in some of those behaviours so that actually she might well get the status, she might well get the position that she craves. When we look at the subscale information for bold, again we can see whether um, we could refine this interpretation for an individual if they get a low score on any of these scales. Um, but if so, what the first subscale here is entitled. So if they score high on this, then these people believe um, that they deserve special treatment, that um, they should get a lot of recognition for their special qualities. Um, and so this continues the theme of challenging, of not rather, of not challenging the assumption that these people have of, of specialness, but that it's likely that the coach is going to be more productive if they simply engage in discussions about behaviours that will succeed for that individual in terms of achieving the recognition that they want. Now, an example here is, is hopefully to guide the individual to seeing that being more generous, being more magnanimous is going to be a more effective way of gaining status and recognition 
from peers and colleagues than is shouting from the rooftops how great they think they are. The second subscale on bold is overconfidence. So if Linda was high on this, she would believe that she would do well at anything, any job that was put in front of her and may well be too optimistic about the likelihood of her success. If things go wrong, people who score high on this are likely to blame other people for, it, for anything that's gone wrong or maybe even external circumstances. And they may try to overreach, they may try and do things that are actually beyond their capabilities. So the coach here needs to encourage the individual to be rather more cautious, but these um, exhortations are likely to be more effective if they're, if they're framed in terms of what the leader's team may be unable to do, not what the leader themselves can't do. So really focusing on if the individual that does exercise greater caution, what a positive impact that would have on the team. And the final subscale here then is fantasized talent. These people who score high here, they believe they've almost been sort of picked out the great things. They have some special destiny for greatness. And again, similarly to the last one, when things go well, they think it's all to do with them, it's all down to them, but if things go badly, it, they will tend to blame other people or external circumstances. So here, um, coaching discussions need to focus on trying to dial down, trying to rein in some of those uh, behaviours associated with the fantasised talent subscale. Um, uh, but to realise um, that you need to encourage the individual to do this, that the benefit, the payoff, is that they are likely to actually attain the greatness that they believe they deserve. If they carry on um, overplaying things and overstating things, then that will have a negative impact on how they're perceived. So in summary, for Linda, then, things that she needs to keep doing, she needs to keep being a role model for positive attitude to change. And you know, people who score high on bold are great for this. They tend to be really optimistic and upbeat. They have a great can-do attitude, um, and they believe in getting things done. So that's, that's all good and that's all positive. But something she needs to stop doing is over-promising. This is this issue of really feeling that you can do everything, that you're capable of doing everything, when in actual fact that may well not be true. There may be certain capabilities that are beyond you. And certainly to stop blaming other people when things go wrong, to start to take some responsibility for your own failures. And finally to start actually sharing credit for accomplishment with other people rather than, again, simply talking about themselves and their own achievement all of the time. So hopefully those two case studies have illustrated how both the subscale information and the coaching strategies can really help you to get more out of the HDS and um, help you to interpret the profile and help you to help your coaching clients to devise strategies for changes for behaviour in the future and help them to have a more positive impact in the workplace and in their relationships with their colleagues at work. In terms of uh, next steps or further actions, uh, further reading or anything else that you might like to do to explore this topic any further, um, there is a book that has been recently published by Hoban Press called Coaching the Dark Side of Personality. And when we send you a copy of these slides, that uh, line, the highlighted blue line, will actually be a link um, to the Hoban Bookstore, so if you wanted to buy a copy of that book. Uh, also, we run HDS Advanced courses where we focus on the subscales and on the coaching strategies, so if you wanted to learn more about that. You can see that the next dates, we have some in, one in March, May and July. And if you booked on um, any of those courses by the 31st of March, you would get a 15% discount if you quote HDS webinar. Okay, and I'm just going to hand over to Jackie. Great, thank you very much Gillian. Uh, we've had a number of questions, so thanks for submitting those. Um, first of all, how do you approach a profile with no high or moderate scores? Okay, um, well the first thing is that usually somebody who doesn't have any high scores, the general interpretation is that they're likely to have fewer problems of an interpersonal nature at work. Um, 
You can, of course, begin to look at if they've got some moderate scores to see if and to discuss with them if there are any of the positives associated with scoring at the higher end on this scale that they've been able to utilise. But the other thing to look at is, say if they're all in the kind of average and low range, is to ask, although that should mean they, could, they should be more successful in their relationships at work, it, do they feel it's ever been a disadvantage? I think sometimes people feel that they don't stand out enough. Um, these extremes of personality, I know we focus on you know, what are the downsides and how to coach people and how to get them to do less of them, but they are also what defines us and they do make us stand out and sometimes we can use them to our advantage. Um, so there, there's that side of it and there's also a kind of side of it that, you know, so maybe you just seem too controlled all of the time and um, so other people get frustrated because you don't actually have any moment where you bubble over into something that is more extreme. For those people who do, <laughs> being faced with somebody who's that steady, maybe they feel you're a bit unreactive. So there are, there are those kinds of questions um, that could be asked of the individual who doesn't get any high scores. Okay, and how do you interpret a profile with high scores in moving against and moving towards as these seem at odds? Well, okay, you have to look at the individual profile. Um, there isn't one strategy, there isn't one size fits all here. And this is where things like the normal personality profile, so the HPI, the MEO, or the 16PF, or whatever normal personality profile you use alongside can become extremely useful. And also, even the values. Um, we often, here at PCL, we tend to use all three Hogan instruments together to get a picture of somebody in the round. And so where you have those elements that seem quite paradoxical, the more information you can get about other aspects of their personality can really help you to understand it. And uh, one thing I would say about that is that sometimes, in my experience, the profiles that seem the most paradoxical, that seem like you couldn't possibly interpret them, there has always been a key to it, there has always been a way to unlock it, and that is through discussion with the individual themselves. And in a way that's good because, because when you look at the profile you think, gosh, how on earth can I make sense of this? You go into your discussion with the individual with no preconceived assumptions. It's not like going for in thinking, oh, this person's all moving away, or this person's all moving against, oh, tick, 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 you know, I know exactly what it is I'm going to say. You go in with much more of an open mind and you get a really good discussion and you find how those potentially what look like conflicts actually do play out for that individual and when those particular high scores appear. So do not fear um, a profile that looks almost impossible to interpret. Um, you will find a way through discussion with the individual to understand it, I'm sure. Okay. And how do you interpret a subscale when it only has two bricks? Yeah, well, <laughs> I think that's towards the low end. So I think anything that's a one or a two uh, of the bricks, um, I think you could use that in terms of saying, okay, so this is something that they're less likely to do. Whereas if it's a three or four, then I'd include that in the description of the individual. If it's a one or a two, if it's a one, obviously definitely leave it out. And if it's a two, probably leave it out. Okay. Can you be low on a scale and high on a subscale? Potentially, yes, um, but I wouldn't want to read too much into that. I am, I, I do tend to prefer the robustness of the complete scale in terms of actually trying to think, okay, is this going to be an issue? Remember on the HDS, it's probably about 14 items per scale, so on a subscale, you know, you're only looking at four, maximum five items. So whilst the reliabilities are sufficient, um, particularly if you score extremely high or extremely low, I, you know, they're, they're not going to be as good as the scale on its own. So the first step, I would say, is look at the high scores on the 11 scales, then take out the ones that you've got high scores on, and then look at the subscales within. Okay. Uh, and a couple of questions along similar kind of lines, um, or along similar lines, is what do you do if a candidate um, doesn't recognise their profile, for example, oh. if they think that they're really stressed? Um, okay. Um, yes, I mean, that, that's a challenge. And sometimes people really are not aware at all 
and and the your interpretation of that profile just doesn't ring true to them and they can't make sense of it. Um, it depends on resources you have available to you. Um, obviously, if you cannot, it needs to be you know, a discussion, it's a two-way discussion. If they don't see it, they don't see it. Um, all that you can say is that usually people who score high on this scale are described by other people as. So the fact that they don't recognize it is something to go away and think about. And maybe they could ask other people who they work with, or they could ask friends and family who they know well, if they've seen any evidence of these styles of behavior. The other thing, of course, which is great to use is to do a 360 alongside because that really helps and it takes the burden off you as well. As the interpreter, all of a sudden you've got lots of comments from people who work with them, which in my experience of using 360s, you know, often with 360s you've got sort of the top opportunities, top strengths, top 10 strengths and the top 10 opportunities to improve. And those opportunities to improve, in my experience, always link back to the individual's HDS profile. Great. Okay, so that was all of the questions. Um, the next webinar in our Hogan series is going to be about um, helping your teams to reach their full potential. So we'll be releasing uh, all the details of that in the coming weeks. So do look out for that. Um, as I mentioned at the beginning, we're going to be circulating a recording of this webinar along with a copy of the slides. Um, so it's just me to say thanks very much, Gillian, and also thank you to everyone for listening. Thank you and goodbye.